Well, I was discussing the idea of uh, forgetting and remembering, and it's when you become a better forgetter that you become a better rememberer. Forgetting helps you remember. You for, as you forget the world, as you forget the ego belief system, simultaneously you remember heaven, or you remember right-mindedness. Pay no attention to those <laughs> clamping dogs behind the screen, on the screen. I am speaking to you from out of time. Pay no attention to the clomping jaws that are seem to be below this figure. So learn to be a good forgetter. In order to remember. I still have, even when we start to get to this depth, I still have this sense that this feeling of yes, I want, I want to know more. I want to go further. I want, I want that to happen. And yet, I can, that's when I really start to become aware of the fear of letting go of the world and letting go of what's familiar and seems to be, you know, like just this room, you know, these bodies here and all that that seems comfortable. And it seems like I need some reassurance that what's, you know, what is real is is going to be familiar, and you know, instead of I guess just the words, and the, the words are in there and you can read them, but there's I haven't had that experience yet. It seems to me what I keep hoping for is some intermediate experiences that. Assure me that it is okay to let go of the world. That, you know, kind of a, seems to be like that would be helpful to do that a few times. Well, if you want those, how could you not have those? I mean, it, to me, the whole thing is when I talk about the rings of the mind and how desire is at the center. Desire is like your altar, and the, the beliefs and the thoughts and the emotions and the perceptions spring out from from that. When the altar is defiled, then you have beliefs that aren't of God, you have thoughts that don't come from God, you have emotions that don't have anything to do with God, and you have perceptions on the outer ring that seem, may even seem comfortable and familiar, but they are distorted and very twisted and very unstable. And so if you really desire that, how could you not have that? And that's one of the things we've been going over and over is that, that that's the only thing you really need to have is that desire that willingness, that it was your desire that brought those experiences, it was the desire that brought that to your mind. It wasn't the action of, of putting some pills into the body that brought that about, but it was your desire of your mind. That was a witness to your desire for awakening. No different than we described when somebody seemed to have a near-death experience, or they seemed to have a, a, a mystical high, like they talk about sometimes runner's high. They try to explain it with endorphins and all this stuff, body chemistry and this and that, and oh no, that's not the source of the mystical experience. You know, it's, it's always the mind. And I, I would say it goes back to when you first came, the very first sentence that you, when you came in and we were going over, it was talking about the reasoning of the world which was saying that you are the cause of what I do and, and while you attack I must be innocent, as if there was a cause or an attack outside my own mind. And basically the sense that you walked right in on, so to speak, was yet it seems sensible because it looks as if the world were hurting you. And so it seems as if there is no need to go beyond the obvious in terms of cause. See that's when you feel or when you're feeling that we'll say lack of energy or like, oh, I don't know if I want to look at my mind so closely. I'd rather have a nice, breezy, breezy, relaxing day doing some other stuff than to look so closely at my mind. It's because the mind believes and really it seems as if there is no need to go beyond the obvious in terms of cause. Well, the mind figures the reason I'm tired is because I, I only got so many hours of sleep or I didn't get enough stuff, to, the proper foods to eat, or I didn't talk about exercise, like you said, 
I didn't get any exercise, and so I noticed the feeling like that. All of those are part of the thinking of the world that thinks it knows why there's a fatigue or why there's. Um, it's kind of like um, I've heard before. I have just a. I sometimes just don't have the perseverance with the course, or I have a lack of interest, or I start to get more lackadaisical with it. I need to surround myself with people who are more intense or who are studying the course more and this and that. As if somehow magically by having other bodies around that are reading or talking about the words would would intensify one's desire to study the course. It may seem that way, but what's happened when people have come together in community to try to live the course is they come together and the very thing that they thought would intensify their desire they might go run, run into corners and get me out of here. <laughs> I know. I don't want to because they don't want to look so closely at their at their mind and at their own thoughts and beliefs. So there's all these subtle ways and so the answer that Jesus gives to and so it seems as if there is no need to go beyond the obvious in terms of cause. Jesus says there is indeed a need to go beyond the obvious. To go beyond the back of thinking. Yes. And when you say, I really would like some intermediate experiences of it, not just the words. You know, the, the words are kind of like, if you think of words as just tools or as symbols for the mind, they're just symbolic too. Everything that you're hearing is just has the meaning that you gave to it. So if my desire becomes so single and so focused and so intense and so clear that then everything that I perceive will will be a witness to that. I'll be able, in short, to hear the Holy Spirit in everything. All things are echoes of the voice for God. All things are lessons that God would have me learn. That turns it around. To me, it turns it around from thinking, um, Oh, it's great. We have all these sessions and we talk and we have all these words, but I want the experience, you know, kind of separating them apart. I don't see, for me, experience is not apart from, from the words. The words, when I have my intention to be truly helpful, the words just like flow or the words are just symbolic of the experience. What I'm feeling is the experience. The words are like, just kind of coming off like as offshoots of it. We'll talk about that a lot too, because that's been one of the things we've been going into is, we actually were talking about that this morning, before you came, was the whole thing of, of making an idea of something. You know, you can take an idea from the Course, the one I was using this morning is, the truth is true and only the truth is true. Nice idea. <laughs> and yet, as long as there's still backward thinkings in, involving sexuality, involving exercise, involving food, involving, um, you know, all the seeming aspects of the world, as long as there's backward thinking, as long as I believe there's something positive in the world, then what meaning does the truth is true and only the truth is true have. It's just kind of like a, an idea, sentimentally, like, oh, that's, sentimentally that sounds good. But <laughs> my experience, <laughs> you know, seems to be divorced from the idea. So we just investigate everything that seems to stand in the way from that being an experience. Hang in there. <laughs> I was sitting at the, I was sitting this morning just feeling like man, I've just been really tired lately and, and just and, and then really getting in touch with actually slightly depressed, feeling a, a feeling of depression and 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 then I started to get in touch with the I 
nothing but feeling that it was because I don't feel like I have any future and yet I'm not sure, you know, I've gotten rid of this projected future and yet I'm not sure what I've replaced it with. And, um, and then I just, you know, I just, you know, just, I knew that, that even if you follow that out, I mean, the depression can't be the end. I mean, the end, it doesn't end in, the, the story doesn't end in a sad ending, so there's got to be a way out of this, and, you know, and I started to think, you know, I just got to stay with, you know, my purpose and, you know, get over there and do a session, and I do feel much better now. This, in the logistic meeting, it came up yesterday, I don't know if you were here or not, but the discussion was for the pamphlets to have a mission statement, and I was suggesting that there be a mission statement drawn up, and Tom just said, well, I'm not clear, and I don't think any of us are clear, so David, why don't you write the mission statement for it? And so this morning, I, it came through the mission statement, a little short, concise little thing, and it was, Tom was coming down and was joking, and he was saying, I didn't know what I was. Now I have something. <laughs> so if you feel depressed and you think you have no future, there you go. <laughs> That's the anchor. That could be your anchor.